This podcast contains murder and mayhem, guts and gore, adult language, and sexual content. Exactly what you came here for. All the listener discretion is advised. Welcome. I am your mistress of the macabre, Sarah Tierra. Grab your Ouija board, light the candles, and grab your jar of human teeth because you and I are going to escape for a bit. Pour yourself a cocktail, pull the window shades closed, and find a cool, dark, quiet place. Because right now we delve into the macabre. Hello and welcome back to the Mistress of the Macabre podcast. I'm Sarah Tierra, of course. If you're new, hello, you're home now. Uh, Welcome back. My entire life has fallen apart since we've spoken last, but you know what? We keep on trucking. It's just what we do. Just a heads up, they are renovating a unit above me. I'm going to do my best to work around it, but there's really nothing I can do. I hope you don't hear it, but you never know. Also, this uh, case takes place in Colombia. I am not going to have perfect pronunciations. I will do my best, but I would say set your expectations at like 50%, 30%, 30%, and then maybe you can be surprised and it's not as bad as... 30%. Just lower those expectations a little bit for me. That'd be great. Thank you. This is part one of three. We're covering three Colombian serial killers. It's going to be a little series. And this is part one. They're all completely horrific. So I hope you're excited. I know I am to tell you this horrible story. Today, we are going to be talking about Luis Garavito, the Beast of Colombia. Luis Alfredo Garavito, known as La Bestia, the Beast, or El Cura, the Priest, is a Colombian serial killer, pedophile, rapist, child molester, and necrophile. It has been confirmed that he committed the rape, torture, and mutilation and murder of 193 minors, predominantly young men and boys in the Western Colombian region, but the real number of victims is believed to be over 400, making him the most prolific serial killer in modern history. So who is this fucker and how have we not heard about him? Let's talk about it. Trigger warning. I don't do trigger warnings. Every episode is a full trigger. The only details I will ever leave out are pertaining to any animal cruelty. That's just personally where my line is. Can't do animals. Won't do it. But I will say, however, this one's really, really bad, and it involves the horrific sexual torture of children. So if that is not for you and that's too much for you, that is fine, and we will see you on the next one. Garavito was born in the small village of Genovo in Colombia on the 25th of January in 1957. He was the son of Rosa Delia and Manuel Antoni and was the first of seven children. He was followed by three brothers and three sisters. He lived a relatively impoverished childhood and was allegedly subjected to frequent abuse. Garavito was born a healthy firstborn son in an impoverished Colombian family in the middle of a civil war that was decades long. Unfortunately, for Garavito's fragile ego and his small penis, I'm guessing, the affronts to his self-worth would come in the form of his six younger siblings, making it seem almost as if he was usurped six times over and replaced at least three times because girls don't fucking matter, I guess. Garavito alleged his father was an adulterous, drunken, macho, incredibly strict, and often physically and emotionally abusive man to him throughout his childhood. That was a very long sentence, and yes, I wrote that. Sorry. Garavito described his mother as a violent woman who showed him little affection and care as a child. Let me guess, people are going to blame her and not his dad. As a result of his father's drinking and extramarital affairs and his mother's aggressive temperament, they frequently fought verbally and physically in the presence of their children, whom they largely neglected. When Garavito was a child, he recalled being strapped to a tree and beaten with a machete case by his father after attempting to defend his pregnant mother, who was being beaten by his father. Because of the spontaneous nature of the physical abuse, his children often hid from Manuel upon his return home from work. Sleeping in the same bed as his father, Garavito also alleged that he had been fondled on one occasion. 
As a child, Garavito was referred to as an imbecile, a bastard, and other pejoratives by his father, whom he claimed, quote, never had a good word, end quote, for him, solely bringing his son with him for work-related purposes and to run errands. When attending school, he was reportedly enthusiastic, but gradually became shy and reserved, primarily due to frequent ridicule by the other children. His teachers noted Garavito's desire to learn conflicted with his extreme frustration with an inability to understand subjects. Nicknamed Garabato, meaning squiggle. <laughs> That's hilarious. For his glasses and timid nature by peers, Garavito was insecure of his glasses and eventually preferred playing alone at recess, often reacting violently in response to frequent taunting by his classmates. His teachers made no attempts to stop the bullying, which distressed Garavito. I love how every serial killer whines about being bullied and uses that as an excuse. I love how every serial killer whines about being bullied and they love to use that as an excuse for the monsters that they become. We're all, we were all bullied. Everyone's bullied. Like you're not, you're not a serial killer because you were bullied. I'm sorry. Being a child is equivalent to being bullied. Like, you're just a fucking whiny loser. Around 1968, he left school in the fifth grade due to poor memory and his father's insistence on making money to sustain the family. This dismayed Garavito, who was also forbidden to have friends or a girlfriend by his father. Shortly thereafter, in 1969, Garavito was subject to extensive physical and sexual abuse by both a local drugstore owner and a neighbor. The drugstore owner would abuse him on his father's visits to the store for Garavito's vaccinations. The neighbor, who was a close friend of his father's, had allegedly bound Garavito to a bed before proceeding to burn him with a candle, cut him with a razor blade and bite his genitals and buttocks on several occasions during these incidents of molestation. These details are very specific and very important for later, so put a pin in this. Yeah, I told you this was going to be bad. Following the first incident, Garavito allegedly killed and dissected two birds in a state of extreme emotional frustration, which prompted him to feel remorse and shame shortly thereafter. After stoning the birds, what... I like to think this means he covered them in Swarovski crystals. That's the only stoning that I know of. I'm going to go with that. He made them fabulous. Garavito began suggesting to his younger brothers and sisters that they sleep with him naked in their shared bed. He then sexually fondled his younger siblings as they slept on multiple occasions after removing their clothes. Garavito also alleged he molested a six-year-old boy. According to those who knew him, Garavito became very withdrawn, extremely aggressive, and, quote, ready to take revenge on the world, end quote. The neighbor's sexual abuse, which rendered him sexually impotent and permanently unable to ejaculate properly, ended after the family's relocation to Trujillo in 1971. Fearing that his father would not believe him and believing his family would not feel concern, Garavito chose to keep his sexual abuse experiences to himself. Soon after arriving in Trujillo, he was shown heterosexual pornography by another neighboring family friend. This family needs some new fucking friends. Because Garavito responded with disgust, the neighbor beat him into the undergrowth before raping him. In 1972, Garavito aggressively and repeatedly attempted to initiate sexual relations with women as a 15-year-old youth himself, but his advances towards them were consistently rejected. Through various alcoholic family members, Garavito had ready access to alcohol and developed an addiction. Due to his rebelliousness and sexual inclinations, Garavito would be kicked out on a repeated basis throughout his teens once by his mother Rosa in 1972 for attempting to rape a five-year-old boy, and again in 1973 following an attempted sexual assault on a six-year-old boy at a train station in Bogota. The boy screamed, which alerted authorities to arrest Garavito, who stated he only wanted to, quote, lightly, end quote, molest the child in response to an attempted rape charge. Following the latter incident, Garavito would be reprimanded by his father, Manuel, for not choosing a woman to sexually assault instead of a young boy. With Garavito's homosexuality causing frequent arguments between him and his father, Manuel, he was evicted for the final time for, quote, homosexual behavior, end quote. As a young man, Garavito started working as an assistant at a compensation fund. He worked at a chain of stores, and then he also began 
studying marketing. Despite his newfound career, he began to have problems with his co-workers, clients, and bosses, which would generally escalate to physical altercations. After losing his job, Garavito worked as a street vendor who sold religious icons and a migrant worker, developing primarily platonic relationships with various women over the course of his adulthood. In 1973, he began to work on a coffee plantation as a youth in Trujillo, falling in love with a school teacher and single mother named Luz Mary Ocampo Orozco, whom he later attended weekly mass services with. Many of the women he befriended had children, surprise, whom Garavito reportedly nurtured as if they were his own children, in addition to being a loving boyfriend when he was sober. His companions likewise described him to be amicable despite his notably violent temper and occasional drunken states in which he vowed to murder his father. While drunk, Garavito, an increasingly jealous and controlling partner in relationships, was also prone to physically abusing his girlfriends over insignificant problems, if there were any at all. As a result, he often found himself the subject of town gossip and frequent evictions by his female partners later in life. In the 1970s, Garavito began suffering symptoms of psychosis, paranoia, and depression, which he attributed to various abuses he claimed enduring in his childhood and adolescence. He then began compulsively molesting both male and female children as his condition gradually worsened, developing an almost exclusive preference for pubescent boys. Due to depression and suicidal feelings related to his lack of achievement, he expressed desire to start a family. Insisting on having sexual intercourse with female partners when drunk, however, he consistently failed to maintain an erection, prompting an unprovoked emotional rant concerning his hatred for his family. Garavito gradually fell into alcohol to cope with his traumatic childhood and began participating in Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in 1978. Garavito also converted to the Pentecostal faith and began working as a store clerk where he had coincidentally reconnected briefly with his first girlfriend, Luz Mary. Drifting away from his family, he was only close to his older sister, Esther, who avoided him due to his alcoholism. Relocating to the town of Armenia, Garavito acquired a day job at a local bakery. Following his frequent attendance of local church services in which he would remorsefully beat his chest during prayer, Garavito attended Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and occasionally visited psychiatrists before ending his day by frequenting Valencia Park, which was later known as a popular location for child prostitution. He's busy. He's busier than I am. And he hasn't even started killing yet. Moving into the 1980s, after allegedly provoking a fight with his co-workers, Garavito's employment at the bakery was terminated. He subsequently attempted suicide. Following this failed attempt, Garavito sought psychiatric care at the San Juan de Dios Hospital and was repeatedly hospitalized throughout the spring of 1980, where he expressed a desire to die over a belief that his life was, quote, worth nothing, end quote. He was primarily treated for his diagnosed depression in spite of evident psychosis and bulimia. He was, however, prescribed antipsychotic medication. Intent on being truthful with the psychiatrist, Garavito stated he wanted to have children, which was very sly because then he misdirected that into saying that he wanted to start a family which is not what he meant. Fearful of consequences, Garavito chose not to inform the psychiatrist of his pedophilia or his sexual impotence with female partners. Garavito later obtained employment in 1980 at a supermarket in Armenia, being given two-hour lunch breaks on Thursday and Sunday afternoons. That is generous as fuck. He then began a relationship with a single mother, a beautician named Claudia, whom he described as being the first woman whose company he enjoyed. Oh. I'm sure she's thrilled to hear that. This relationship would be short-lived, however, as Garavito apparently could not sustain Claudia's spending habits. Satiating his sexual desires by binding and raping children during his lunch breaks in the neighboring towns, Garavito did not engage in intercourse with Claudia. During this period, Garavito emphasized constant urges to molest the children he encountered at work. In the autumn of 1980, he began carrying razor blades, candles, and lighters to facilitate the torture of his victims. 
victims. In addition, Garavito removed a tooth to be able to bite children more effectively. Following his crimes, he wrote the name of the molested child in a blue notebook and prayed for them while pacing in his room, fervently beating his chest while naked in a ritual-like fashion. Clearly, this guy is doing well. Garavito also began compulsively reading the Bible each night, attempting to find an explanation, particularly in the book of Psalms, for his deviance. Despite this, Garavito developed an interest in esoteric study, tarot readings, and Satanism. He would visit palm readers and other occultic practitioners before deciding that they were just as clueless as he was regarding the occult. Afflicted with bouts of depression and guilt from his crimes, Garavito suffered nightmares about these youths, waking up in tears before entering fits of hysterical laughter as he remembered the pleasure received from their pain. Discovering Adolf Hitler's book Mein Kampf, of course, this motherfucker. Garavito became fond of Hitler upon discovering similarities in their early lives, homosexual experiences, and years spent in vagrancy. This fondness developed into idolization, expressing admiration for Hitler, mass graves of the Holocaust, and stating that he, quote, liked the concentration camps, end quote. I hated saying that sentence. On January 25th, 1984, Garavito was housed under psychiatric care for 33 days following a mental breakdown. He was prescribed antipsychotic medication and referred to psychotherapy for his depression. After obtaining a permit to leave on February 28th of 1984, Garavito fled to Pereira, where he immediately molested, burned, and bit two children in the sector of Gestamani before leaving their photographs with his older sister. When the children publicly identified him, Garavito fled the city. He then resumed storing scalpels, candles, and razor blades in plastic bags for future victims. Having molested and tortured more than a hundred children by this period, Garavito was briefly detained for stealing jewelry from a friend. In addition to his fascination with Hitler, Garavito developed an obsession with Colombian spree killer Campo Elias Delgado in December 1986. Immediately admiring his mass murder at a Bogota restaurant, the attention it received, and wanting to emulate him as he and others noted it on television at a bar. From this point on, Garavito harbored extensive fantasies of acquiring a machine gun and, starting with his father, annihilating his family before committing suicide. Admiring mass murderers akin to that of Delgado's, Garavito felt that committing suicide following a mass murder would be an ideal way to die for him. During this period, Garavito found another girlfriend named Graciela Zabaleta, a single mother who resided near the local psychiatric centers in which he was committed. After introducing himself, Garavito casually suggested that she be his permanent companion. Charmed by his confidence, Zabaleta let Garavito live with her in exchange for providing meals and paying bills in their household. As such, Garavito regularly spent his spare savings on his new family in Pereira. Staying for three or four hours on average, Garavito was generally absent, but took care to warn Zabaleta's teenage son not to go into the street and to take care of himself, displaying love and affection he felt he never had in his early life towards the family. Despite this, Zabaleta was wary of Garavito's alcohol alcoholism, which often spurred scandalous and antisocial behavior. Like Les Mary, Garavito also would later claim to have loved Zabaleta. After being seen drunk in the company of various pubescent youths of humble appearance by his friends, Garavito's companions became aware of their friend's pederasty. Despite this, Garavito was not confronted, and most of his acquaintances did not suspect any sexual deviation. In addition, his various girlfriends were also oblivious to Garavito's predilections. Starting in 1988, Garavito began documenting his crimes, keeping them in black cloth suitcases at several females' residences. While operating a Ouija board, Garavito alleged that he entered a state of psychosis in which the devil had asked whether he would like to serve him. Answering that he would, the devil responded saying, kill that with killing, many things may come. Attempting to commit his first murder on October 1st, 1992, and yes, those hundreds of children were molested and raped and tortured, but he hasn't killed anyone yet. We haven't even gotten to it. So buckle your seatbelts. So attempting to commit his first murder on October 1st, 1992, Garavito sought a young boy who had been selling sweets and cigars to passersby. In a state of drunkenness, he lured the youth who he planned on bringing to a wooded lot to the Milia Hotel sector in Bolivar, Colombia, before being interrupted and beaten by local police, one of whom 
hit him over the head with a revolver. As Garavito bled, they then stole 100,000 pesos, a watch, and a ring from him before letting him go from a police station. Garavito then resolved to commit murder three days later. Committing his first murder of a boy named Juan Carlos on October 4, 1992, Garavito began wearing various disguises in order to evade identification and arrest. Known locally as Goofy, a generous man who gave to children in Trujillo, locals went out of their way to keep documents for Garavito. For years, Garavito documented his crimes by tickets, receipts, clothes, and identity cards of victims in his black cloth suitcase. Garavito left the suitcase with his sister Esther before giving it to Luz Mary. He also collected their amputated toes before disposing of them for fear that the Colombian National Police's scent dog team may trace them to him. In June 1996, Garavito complained to Lutz Mary of losing his temporary job as a salesman for air fresheners, begging for a place to stay in exchange for food and financial relief. Wary of Garavito for his alcoholism and temper, she took him in briefly with hesitance. Garavito then suffered a hard fall in the Guacamayas neighborhood of Bogota, breaking his leg in August of 1996. Stricken with pain, he resided temporarily with a man before begging his girlfriend, Lutz Mary, to let him stay with her at a residence again. Restricted by having to use crutches, wear a neck brace, and a cast, Garavito resorted to begging on the street for the two months that he resided with her. Garavito provided for the household by paying for meals and other means, such as bringing a television. He remained hostile, however, and entered a fight with his girlfriend's 15-year-old son for wanting to watch the local news. Lutz Mary subsequently evicted Garavito, who derided her son as disrespectful and rude, and had also damaged a gold chain she had given gifted to him. Later that year, on Christmas Day, Lutz Mary received a gift from a visiting friend, which prompted an angry, drunken phone call from Garavito, who stated that he, quote, didn't like those F words, end quote, visiting as he feared they would steal her generosity from Garavito. After being informed he was no longer welcome, Garavito appeared the next morning shouting obscenities and threats while grabbing at Lutz Mary's throat prompting her and the family to hide at a neighbor's house. After several hours, Garavito left an apology note asking for her forgiveness and noting his damage to their household. Nicknamed Conflict by the locals, Garavito was frequently seen drunk and drifting from town to town as he outwore his welcome, often due to his domestic disputes with co-workers, abuse of his girlfriends, and general inability to behave normally. His erratic behavior reportedly left him unable to develop meaningful relationships, despite living with two Two different women and Paria at the time of his arrest. Between 1980 and 1992, Garavito was estimated to have raped and tortured a minimum of 200 youths, a period during which he had actively spent five years under psychiatric care, having attempted suicide several times. Wherever Garavito had resided during this time, reports of child molestation in said areas increased dramatically. Toward the end of Garavito's crime spree, he drifted through western Colombia as a homeless drifter. Weary of murdering minors who he felt were much too easy to lure, Garavito developed plans to eventually commit a mass murder in which he would kidnap several adults and murder them as he attracted the attention of journalists, possibly dying in the frenzy. Garavito then attempted the sexual assault of a 12-year-old named John Ivan Sabogal on the 22nd of April 1999 for being able to perform this mass murder. A prolific pederast and torturer of youths, Garavito began to feel apathy with his crimes. On October 4th, 1992, he had spotted a 13-year-old boy, Juan Carlos, walking near a bazaar that he had been drinking at. According to Garavito, the reflection of the moonlight had invoked a strange force within him, reminding him of his childhood, which compelled him to murder upon entering a state of rage. He began to follow the child, buying synthetic rope and a butcher knife on the way, before offering him work for 500 or 1,000 pesos. The boy left the crowded area in Jamandi with Garavito to go to a remote area near the local railroad, where he was later found with his front teeth knocked out, severe cuts to his rectum and throat, and his genitals severed. Waking upon sunrise, Garavito began sobbing as he noted the bloodstains of Carlos on his clothes. On October 10th, 1992, Garavito would make the trip to Trujillo to see his sister Esther. Attempting to control his urges by drinking brandy, he began breaking containers in a state of rage after seeing a child pass by. Garavito then murdered 
murdered 12-year-old John Alexander Panaranda on the way to his sister's residence while in Cholula. He then began to compulsively murder youth, predominantly male and poverty-stricken, and collected their amputated toes. That's fucked up. In 1993, Garavito also began cutting into his victims' bellies, luring eight youths aged 9 to 11 from a local school to a nearby wooded lot in the La Victoria district. For fear of being traced by bloodhounds, Garavito then discarded their amputated toes for murdering Henry Giovanni Garcia, Marco Aurelio, Castano, Juan David Cardenas, Jaime Orlando Popayan, and three more unidentified children in the southeast Bogota. He then murdered two additional children in the Maicen neighborhood before departing for Tulula to Paria and Quimbaya, then to Tula again, where he murdered more children, ending his spree in 1993, the death of 13-year-old Mauricio Mondero Meja. In early 1994, Garavito would lure a Bogota youth estimated to be about 12 years old who had fallen asleep on a bus. After providing him with brandy, Garavito proceeded to strip and bind the boy at a secluded ravine spot. In a dazed state before noticing a foul odor, he then let the child go after discovering the source of the odor was a mass grave. Immediately, the child that he had just let go seized the knife, severing Garavito's tendons in his left hand with the weapon before being overpowered and murdered by him. Oh no, he was so close. Poor kid. Okay, on February 4th, 1994, Garavito would lure 13 year old Jaime Andreas Gonzalez from the Plaza de Boliviar to a sugarcane field shortly after being expelled from a bar that night, complaining of their food. Noting a crucifix in the area, he entered a brief psychosis in which he buried his knife, prayed for forgiveness retrieved the knife, and then returned to his hotel room to chant scripture from the 57th Psalm for several hours until dawn. On January 12th, 1997, Garavito murdered an eight-year-old boy before murdering an additional two minors during this period. The victims were all almost exclusively boys, although Garavito has also been noted by local media to have molested and murdered female victims. In addition to his 172 initial charges of murder, Garavito also confessed to 28 more murders in 2003, of which five were adults. All adult victims were thought to have been killed to rid Garavito of potential witnesses rather than to fulfill personal fantasy. Garavito was also said to have operated in Ecuador during the summer of 1998, when he murdered 14-year-old Abel Gustavo Lur Velez, a local shoe shiner and paperboy, on July 20th, 1998, and 12-year-old Jimmy Leonardo Palacios Ashindia in Chon, Ecuador. Both boys were from poor families and disappeared at noon. Garavito was subsequently spotted at an all-girls school in Santo Domingo, Ecuador, before fleeing Ecuadorian authorities who had been setting up an operation to catch him. They had found two corpses, one of whom was a young girl who had had been raped, tortured, murdered, and discarded in similar fashion to that of Garavito's modus operandi. Marked for his thick Colombian accent, locals spotted a foreign drifter begging for money in July and August of that year. In addition, Garavito also stated that he had allegedly committed murder in Venezuela. Despite his high victim count, there were four children who survived their encounters with Garavito. How are you guys doing? You hanging in there? I know it's rough. That's what we do here. Do you want to make a sandwich? Maybe you should go make yourself a refreshing beverage. Take a little moment, have a little peace of mind moment, and then come back to me because I'm not done. I'm not even close to done telling you this story. This is a mental health check. In 1979, Garavito, wielding a machete, see... This is so fucked up. Wielding a machete, seized victim nine-year-old William Trujillo Mora, who was interviewed and... In- oh, he survived. I forgot we're at that part. Yay. Okay, it's looking up for a minute. Okay, so little William Trujillo Mora, who was interviewed and featured on the Colombian television program Los Informantes in the Valle de Cuaca region as he was about to join other playing children, hugging him and threatening to kill him if he screamed. Mora obliged and he was escorted by Gary veto to an abandoned building where he was sexually molested and tortured for 12 hours. Oh, I got excited too soon. That's 
horrible. When Garavito sensed that someone was near the house, he urged the child to remain silent. When Garavito lost consciousness from drinking, Mora managed to escape. In 1988, Garavito lured an unidentified victim who he had sexually assaulted near a restaurant called El Arapazo in the Alto del Rio sector, a location where several bodies were later found within a 20 meter proximity of one another, which is about 65 feet or two and a half London buses proximity of one another. Following an earthquake on January 25th, 1999, authorities found the owner of the restaurant, which was reduced to rubble, who pointed them to Garavito, whom he had known for many years and avoided due to his drinking problem and aggressive tendencies. In the early 1990s, Garavito would approach 10-year-old Carlos Alberto, offering him gifts and 200 pesos in exchange for work. Garavito led Carlos to the Alto de La Taza, where he amicably spoke with the child. Upon reaching a secluded hill spot, Garavito placed a knife at Carlos's throat before proceeding to bind, rape, and torture him. After doing so, Garavito asked Carlos whether he enjoyed it. Humiliated and fearful of Garavito, Carlos stated that he liked it, prompting Garavito to leave after stating, so fucked, quote, see you next week. That's how I like it, that you also like it. End quote. Brand Fernie Bernal Alvarez was a 16-year-old youth who worked with his father in the rooster fighting business in the 1990s. While Bernal, we're going to let that pass because he's a victim. Bernal Alvarez was tending to the roosters in the cockpit when Garavito took him to a secluded spot by threatening him with a knife. He then proceeded to bind, sexually assault, and torture Bernal Alvarez with methods ranging from stabbing Alvarez seven times with a screwdriver as he raped him to be the youth until weak. Alvarez broke free from his restraints and fled from Garavito. Garavito had a very specific modus operandi, or MO. According to Garavito, he primarily targeted children of humble background who had light-colored eyes and were working class, homeless, peasants, or orphaned. Claiming to feel a force within him that compelled him to kill, Garavito would look for children and lure them away by bribing them with small gifts, such as money, candy, or odd jobs. Terrified of the dark, he would approach them in broad daylight in public places, ranging from the countryside to crowded city streets. He would also wait and drink brandy near school zones on evenings to wait for unknowing children. He had a preference for male youth, as we've said a million times, with light-colored eyes and fair complexion. Having been raised in the heavily Spanish-descended Pasia region of Colombia, Garavito knew where to find the boys that fit his criteria. He offered easy work for money and even disguised himself as different characters who could be seen as legitimately having a reason to interact with children, such as a priest, monk, farmer, homeless man, street vendor, fortune teller, baker, drug dealer, school teacher, charity organization worker, bar and restaurant manager, elderly man, and a gambler. He often posed as a monk or priest. One of his many nicknames in Colombian media was El Cura and lured children with promises of money or drinks. To prevent suspicions about his activities from developing, Garavito would change his disguise often. Once he had lured the poor child away, he would walk with him for a time encouraging the boy to share about his life in order to earn his trust. In reality, the beast was wearing the boys down, walking just long enough that they would eventually get tired, making them vulnerable and allowing the serial killer to attack. Once he had the trust of a child, Garavito would walk to a secluded spot or mass gravesite with the victim, encouraging them to talk about their personal life until they were tired and vulnerable, which made them easy to handle. After sipping about half a bottle of brandy, Garavito would proceed to bind the child, intimidating them them with a knife as he fondled and sometimes masturbated over them. According to Garavito, he made a pact with the devil, and satanic rituals were also incorporated into the murders of the children, who were apparent blood sacrifices. First, Garavito would corner the tired victims and bind their wrists together. Then he would torture them endlessly. Usually, the child would endure prolonged rape and torture by having the hands, feet, and buttocks stabbed with a screwdriver. Garavito was also known to place broken blades between his fingers and flay the skin of the child's buttocks. I told y'all this was going to be bad. Teeth were often knocked out and sharpened objects inserted into the anus. 
The penis and testicles were also often severed and placed into the child's mouth while alive. They were burned with a lighter, stomped on, and often showed deep cuts in the back, belly, and throat. In some cases, they were sexually abused as their intestines poured out of their bellies, impaled through the anus and out of the mouth, and stabbed over 100 times. Don't look at me. I tried to warn you. Ugh, this is hard. Garavito's climax would occur when he had decapitated the child alive or cut the throat as he finished for leaving the severed genitals in the mouth of the decapitated head. He was very into decapitation. Necrophilia with the victim's corpse was also occasionally involved in the crimes, sometimes prematurely as Garavito could only achieve orgasm by beating and stabbing his victims during intercourse. The bodies of the children were all found completely naked and all bore bite marks and signs of anal penetration. Containers of lubricant were found near the bodies, along with empty bottles of the cheapest brandy in Colombia. Most corpses showed signs of prolonged torture. Garavito also collected his victims' amputated toes, which he was forced to discard for fear of being traced by bloodhounds. Luis Garavito's methodology speaks of vastly a different kind of sadism. Garavito's style was simple. He would rape his victims first, then disembowel or slit their throats. Death came after the act of rape, not as a part of it. This indicates that Garavito likely had sadistic personality disorder, rather than a proclivity for sexual sadism. He enjoyed the sense of godlike power the psychological and physical suffering of others brought to him. For Garavito, the act of sex was tainted with the abuse he had suffered at the hands of his neighbors, parental figures whom he trusted, leading to his repetition of the act with his victims. Garavito did not leave his victims alive to suffer through what he had suffered through. In his mind, to do so would have been an act of mercy or, as is more likely, relinquishing of power. One of the key motivations motivators of sadistic murders is the basic need for control. For Garavito, who experienced the cruelty of sadism as a child and continuously felt wrongly usurped, likely manifested in the way he tortured most of his victims after the rape, as an ultimate show of dominance before the final act of murder. For someone like Luis, who would have at one time been used to constant attention as the firstborn child, the isolation he might have felt as he was relegated to the position of just another child, compounded with the low self esteem and lack of ability to initiate any form of normal intimacy after his rape created for him a sense of alienation, one that would later catapult him into his life as a shadow of a man, a monster who hunted children by night and masqueraded by day, seemingly unimpaired by the scars of his past, using the pseudo-personas he'd crafted to lure over 147 boys to grisly deaths. Okay, so congratulations! You've made it through the worst of it, and it was worst for sure. So yes, Garavito has been torturing, raping, and murdering children in a decades-long rampage. So what happens to him? How has he not been caught yet? What's up with the mass graves? Let's start from the beginning again, but no, don't worry. Not like that. But this time, the beginning of the investigation, because it's definitely interesting. As a country that had been immersed in political and social strife for the past 50 years, Colombia struggles to provide even the most basic security to its citizens. It is in this chaos of incessant political unrest that created, in the shadows of every impoverished neighborhood, the perfect victim pool. For as crowded as Colombia's streets are, one specific group of people will remain forever unseen. Its street children. Colombia's continuous political strife has bred a subculture of anonymous children. Garavito carefully selected his prey from the children of low-income households who were more vulnerable to the charms of a wandering peddler or pleasant priest, as the anonymity meant lower risk of discovery. This was a significant factor in Garavito's crimes going undetected for so long. Beginning in October 1992, minors between the ages of 6 through 16 began disappearing rapidly from the streets of Colombia. Due to the decades-long civil war, many children in Colombia were impoverished and unlikely to be reported missing. Several women began reporting their children missing, and a group of children discovered a skeleton in Paria while playing football on November 7, 1998. Yet authorities did not take much notice until November 15th, when mass graves of as many as 36 children were uncovered, almost all of them boys, with signs of binding, sexual assault, and prolonged torture. They discovered a total of 41 children in the department of Risaralda, with 27 children discovered in neighboring Valle del Coaca. April 22, 1999, was just another day at the Los Centuros Park, Villa Vicente.
Crescencio. Located in eastern Colombia, the park itself was part of the regular route for an impoverished young boy named Ivan Sabogal, who sold lottery tickets to help fund his schooling. Ivan's abduction, or rather, as it was then noted, disappearance, was not discovered until later that evening when his mother realized he had not returned home by the assigned time. Terrified, Ivan's mother contacted the police and pleaded with them to take on her son's case, hoping to be able to convince them that there was indeed something sinister about Ivan's not coming home that day. In a country like Colombia, as Ivan's mother had little to no power to exert, his abduction could have easily been glossed over, and probably would have been, had it not been for the prosecutor, Fernando Aya. Aya was already investigating the disappearances of 13 other young children in the span of six months. He discovered several mass graves just on the outskirts of Villa Vicentio and identified a pattern in Ivan's case that was consistent with previous disappearances. This guy is a fucking hero. Villa Vicentio was not the only village affected. Thousands of miles away, in the heart of Colombia's coffee district, another set of mothers were desperately trying to appeal to the authorities to find their missing sons, each hoping against hope that their son would be the one to come home. This large number of missing children called for a widespread investigation, as these killings were not confined to a specific area. The brutality was so fierce to authorities that they initially hypothesized the killings were performed by a satanic cult or an international child trafficking ring. The horrors of Garavita's reign of terror had begun long before the investigation. Years before this, dead children were being discovered all across Colombia in mass graves. One such discovery took place in the quaint little town of Nesideros, where the tortured bodies of 14 children, ranging from 8 to 14 years old, were unearthed, baffling the Colombian police. What was even more shocking was the state of the remains. These were not recently deceased bodies. The bodies being unearthed were already decomposed to the point where there was almost no way of individual identification. All that was recoverable at this point were the bones and teeth. Surprisingly, the dental records did initiate major breakthroughs, although none of these children had had work done on their teeth, indicating that they could not afford it, which put them in the same economic subgroup as the missing street children. Mario Artungada, Colombia's most renowned forensic reconstructionist, began working on the bones of the children that were recovered. It was here that the forensic team hit their first major roadblock. The team soon realized that the diagnostic that they were used to working with would not apply to these cases because the subjects were children as opposed to grown adults. The malleable nature of their bones and the way in which their craniums were constructed called for a major adaptation in the process. Artungada realized that he would have to create his own methods, and so he did. Meanwhile, the authorities began to chase down every lead they could. Theories ranged from satanic cults to drug traffickers. Every scrap of evidence was considered and reconsidered. The only thing they could be sure of was that, whatever they were dealing with, they could not afford to miss any clues. Back in Villa Vicencio, when Aya was still looking for evidence in his initial investigation, he decided to go and stake out the points of disappearance, hoping that this would allow him to reconstruct the crimes and understand how the abductions took place. Once he arrived at the disappearance points, Aya was confounded. Each one was located in a heavily populated area. How could the abductions have gone unnoticed? Why had the stench of the bodies not been reported? Aya and his team decided to do some groundwork in an attempt to figure out exactly how this happened. Very soon, Aya and his team began to realize how easy it was to miss an abduction in that region. Despite the high population, the area was covered in thick vegetation, and the terrain much too difficult to walk through, making it very difficult for an abduction to have been detected. In the other end of the country, Detective Aldemar Duan, who had previously investigated three similar murders, recognized similarities with other cases all around the country. He cross-referenced the murders against the homicides and abductions of a similar nature dating from 1991 to 1998. His hunch became the key to unlocking the mysteries of Garavito's damning pattern. They also now had evidence to work with as well. Forensic scientists were now supplied with the nylon threads, alcohol bottles, and a particular methodology that convinced police that the murders were not the work of a team or organization, that they were dealing with one man, a sexual sadist who single-handedly raped and murdered hundreds of Colombia's children. The Colombian authorities knew that they needed all the help they could get with this case. Colombia had little to no experience managing such cases, so they reached out to their counterparts in the 
the FBI asking for files on cases similar to the ones they were now investigating. I will say these Colombian investigators, they might have dropped the ball at first, but they get their shit together pretty well. For sure. Then in February of 1998, the bodies of two naked children were found in Perea, lying next to each other. A few feet away, another corpse was found. All three had their hands bound and their throats slashed. The murder weapon was also found nearby. It was now February of 1999, and yet another mass grave had been unearthed, this time in Palmira, just 60 kilometers south of Nesideros. Carlos Herrera joined the task force. Herrera obtained over 13 pieces of evidence from this crime scene, one of which was a pair of shoes that would later help investigators identify an important physical characteristic of the murderer. The shoes showed extreme wear towards the ends of the soles, indicating that the shoes were too big for their wearer. Furthermore, the heel of one of the shoes was nearly worn through, which Herrera concluded indicated a limp or a rotating gait from some sort of injury. The shoes also helped investigators predict the man's height. He would be somewhere between five foot three and five foot four and a half. Duran's team decided that if they were to unmask this murderer, they would have to find a way to enter the world he lived in. A handful of Colombia's top detectives went undercover in the country's homeless populace, each in an area the murderer was most likely to target again. The theoretical noose around Garavito's neck tightened further. Finally, the authorities were one step closer. The 1999 crime scene was largely what Herrera used to piece together the remnants from the crime scene evidence to create a criminal profile that the murderer would fit into. These tiny little details based on those pieces of information would add up to a very specific personality and the physical body type, helping the authorities create a narrow suspect pool. The pair of charred glasses and a specific brand of alcohol were also recovered from the crime scene. The charring was something that none of the tests could account for, but the lenses did reveal a condition specific to two age groups, 40 to 45 or 55 to 60. The glasses were also bent at an awkward angle that indicated the wearer probably had widely separated ears. Aside from age range, height, a preference for a particular brand of alcohol, and two possible distinguishing characteristics, there was still next to no physical evidence that would identify Garavito. As such, the investigators began to focus on behavior profiles. Various currencies left at the crime scene hinted that the killer might be moving around Colombia with relative ease, that somehow he was blending in with the crowds of Colombia without raising suspicion. The investigators decided to look into the victim profile, realizing that, given the suspect's probable age, he would have been active much longer than anyone realized, and that would mean there might be more cases than they initially thought. The authorities pulled over 10 years of crime records and allocated roughly 5,000 cases to the probable suspect pool. Based on the already known parameters, they removed all with female victims and were left with over 1,500 male perpetrators. They then excluded suspects based on height and age and then narrowed the list further by focusing on those who were active in the areas of the already known crime scenes. The final list consisted of 25 names. That is some good policing. Duran's icy determination to capture Garavito had earned him the name The Murderous Shadow. He had become so invested in the case that he flew to Bogota to ascertain more information on the relating case files. It was there that Duran came across another strong lead. In 1996, there were reports of yet another child who went missing, Reynold Delgado, a 12-year-old boy from the region of Tunja, bordering the north of Bogota. Delgado's case closely matched that of the current victim pool, only unlike the others, Delgado's case included a suspect. A shopkeeper had reported that the boy had last been seen in the company of a man who was not from the region, who had been identified and brought in for questioning, only to be released due to a lack of concrete evidence. This man's name was Luis Alfredo Garavito, a name that appeared on the list of 25 suspects that the investigators had compiled. Duran knew immediately that this was no coincidence. A careful examination of the file revealed other connections. For instance, Garavito's birthplace was registered as Genova, the place where Duran's original three cases had occurred. Furthermore, his place of residence, as per his written statement, was Trujillo, the location of yet another mass grave. The official investigation, however, had taken a different turn. A suspect had been identified in Perea, one with a limp and in the purported age range, and he was seen selling honey around the area of the crime scenes. His name was Pedro Pachuga. In October of 19. 
1997, two young boys disappeared from a train station in Perea, and Pechuga was a top suspect. The boys were later discovered dead. Just days later, another young boy identified Pechuga as an attempted rapist. Sure of their target, the investigators scoured the streets for the man they thought was responsible for the hundreds of found bodies strewn across Colombia. Within weeks, the investigators caught and arrested Pedro Pechuga. There was only one catch. Pechuga insisted he was innocent. During his incarceration, Pechuga continue to plead his innocence, which in itself wasn't unusual. But within weeks, the murderer had struck again, this time in Bogota. Four boys were murdered with the exact same MO. It became clear that the prosecutors had indeed apprehended the wrong man. Authorities were shaken. The body count was now well past 100 and rising. They knew that they needed to take care in terms of recovery of evidence as they could not afford any mistakes. The Colombian investigation became a meld of every relevant foreign technique that they could possibly replicate, from the British techniques of evidence recovery with color-coded crime scenes to the Russian and American techniques of forensic facial reconstruction. Soon, four of the victims had been identified by the families, another crucial step in the ongoing investigation. Meanwhile, Duran used the case file on Delgado to track down the address left by Luis Alfredo, and in doing so, found Esther Garavito Cubilos, a sister of Luis Garavito. Esther was found to have a bag of Garavito's personal items. Remember, he left that shit like a dumb bitch. The bag contained documents, travel mementos, and a collection of journals that revealed intimate details about Garavito's childhood and later life. Duran's team carefully combed through the documents and found a receipt of money wired to a woman in Perea, where documents revealed he had been implicated in the homicide of a minor by the judicial body in the area. The investigators proceeded to track down the location of the woman, and much to their own surprise, they found yet another suitcase of documents, these dating from 1994 to 1997, in her care. The bag contained synthetic fibers, razors, lubricants, all of which were consistent with what had been uncovered in previous crime scenes. The evidence in Palmyra pointed to one further thing. The suspect in question had been burned. Based on the evidence and the crime scene at Palmyra, the investigators came to the conclusion that the suspect would have been wounded and heavily burned as he left in an attempt to distance himself from his latest victim. A man matching his description allegedly sought help at a pharmacy in Perea, only to disappear right after. This provided yet another physical clue to the suspect's profile. He would have had severe burns along the left side of his body. Although investigators didn't know the exact details yet, outside the town of Palmyra, Myra, the bodies of two naked children were found lying next to each other on a hill near a sugarcane field. The next day, only meters away, they found another child's body. All three bodies had their hands bound and bore signs of sexual abuse. The victims' necks were severely cut and bruises were on their backs, genitals, legs, and buttocks. The murder weapon was found in the same area as the bodies. Garavito had passed out partially naked on top of a child's corpse while drunk, of course, with a lit cigarette in his left hand, causing the cane field to catch fire. He burned himself severely in the process and left behind his money, burnt glasses, shorts, shoes, and underwear. Garavito was picked up by the local police just a few days later on an unrelated charge of attempted rape against 12-year-old John Ivan Sabogal. On April 22nd, 1999, Garavito was drinking brandy in the evening when he encountered Ivan selling lottery tickets in the city of Villa Vicencio. Introducing himself as a local politician, Garavito proceeded to seize Ivan before threatening him with a knife to keep him silent. Pretending to hug Ivan, Garavito escorted him into a taxi before forcing him to climb a barbed wire fence that led to a secluded hillside. At this location, Garavito proceeded to bind Ivan while repeatedly screaming, Am I a sadist? He then taunted the child with the knife blade, shouting various obscenities as he masturbated over him. A homeless 16-year-old had been close enough to hear the struggle between Garavito and the child. The teen began to curse and throw stones at Garavito. Garavito chased the teenager with his dagger. Both the boy and the teen fled to the Rosa Blanca farmhouse located on La Coralina Road in Villa Vicencio, where they were met by a 12-year-old girl. Garavito later reached the farmhouse, aggressively asking the girl for directions. She directed Garavito into the woods where he became lost. The police were contacted, resulting 
resulting in a search. The police were prepared to accept the win that they had been handed by recovering Ivan and were driving him and his mother back to the police station when the unexpected happened. Right there, outside their window, walking along the highway, was a man Ivan identified as his assailant. Authorities found Garavito walking out of the woods at approximately 7 p.m. The man gave them a false ID and claimed to be the politician. Despite this, they suspected the man to be Garavito anyway. On July 4th, 1999, their suspicion was confirmed. Confirmed. Garavito's arrest was strange, to say the least. The man did not struggle or protest in any way. He was unnervingly calm as he persistently claimed that he was not the man the police were looking for. Nothing he said or did would ever make anyone think that this was a man who had murdered hundreds of children across the Colombian countryside. Once they reached the police station, Prosecutor Aya visited the suspect in custody and straight away noticed the physical similarities between the politician and Luis Garavito. He also noticed something the other officers hadn't. On each of the documents that the detainee had signed, his signature varied. Aya took his suspicions in a photograph of this politician to a meeting held with the prosecutors from all over the country regarding the murders. It was here that Aya showed Duran and his team the photograph of the man they had in custody. Duran and his team identified him immediately. The man in the picture was Luis Alfredo Garavito. Finally, all the puzzle pieces fell into place. The scourge of Colombia was finally behind bars. By the end of this final meeting, authorities had little doubt left that the man in custody was indeed Garavito. He was 42 years old. He was five foot four. He wore glasses and had scars and burns along the left side of his body. He was born in Genova and raised in a dysfunctional family and had suffered abuse at the hands of parental figures before the age of 16. Everything fit. Unfortunately, everything was also completely circumstantial, meaning that without Garavito's confession, Colombian authorities could prove nothing in a court of law, or at least not enough to build a solid case. The authorities desperately needed to establish concrete links between the crime scene evidence and Garavito himself. Once again, the investigators started to hunt for evidence to link Garavito to the crimes. Detective Duran, who had been studying Garavito's profile for years now, suggested that there was a possibility that there were more mementos of the victims that Garavito would have saved over the years. They just needed to figure out where they were. It was with this aim in mind that the investigators hunted down Ms. Umbar Toro, one of Garavito's best friends, and coaxed her into visiting Garavito in jail. The investigators were hoping that bringing her in would encourage Garavito's need to open up to his old friend. Sure enough, Garavito confessed to Umbartoro that there was indeed another bag of documents which he had left with another inmate's wife. The contents of this final bag were even more incriminating than those of the first two. The bag contained regional newspaper clippings, paper documents, and even pictures of some of the victims. The bag also contained a scrap of paper with weird markings on it. It was later discovered that the markings were a personal tally of his victims. Despite all of the evidence, Garavito still refused to confess, and the investigators realized that it was unlikely he ever would. Without a confession, the prosecutors would need an airtight case if they wanted to put Garavito behind bars. Nothing could be left to chance. It was clear that now was the time to establish a concrete link between the evidence collected and Garavito himself. First and foremost, the prosecution would need to establish a DNA link between Garavito and the DNA recovered from the crime scenes. Then there was the matter of the glasses that had been recovered. They needed to be able to determine Garavito's eye condition without tipping him off and thereby giving him the chance to lie about it. To avoid any disruption on Garavito's part, the entire prison was subjected to an eye exam and it was during this exam that Garavito's cell was searched for traces of DNA to run against the crime scene samples obtained off the liquor bottles and the bodies. The prescription for the charred glasses came back as a match, and yet the prosecution still didn't think they had enough evidence to seal his fate. The Colombian authorities decided to use Link, a Dutch software that cross-references events, coincidences, and probabilities. They input the software with hotel reports, witness testimonies, and evidence. Link's report placed Garavito at every single crime location at the time of the event, stacking huge weight behind the prosecution's case that Garavito was the only possible perpetrator. They decided that with conviction, but as a final attempt to make the case as airtight as possible, they decided to take another shot at Garavito himself. This time, Garavito went through an eight-hour interrogation. They tried to rattle his demeanor, but Garavito remained calm and stable, maintaining the entire time that he was 
not only innocent, but that all the evidence in witness testimony merely pointed to a flawed investigation. At this point, the head of Garavito's investigation decided to end the interrogation, recognizing that Garavito was far too composed to crack under the pressure they were applying. He knew that they needed a different approach if they were going to destabilize him enough to get a confession. They were going to need someone who knew Garavito better than Garavito knew himself. Prosecutor Naranjo authorized a private meeting between Garavito and Detective Duran, the only man who knew the cases well enough to go toe-to-toe with Garavito. What followed would go down forever in the history books as the end of Luis Garavito. Duran decided to approach the only part of Garavito that wasn't capable of staying detached, his fantasy realm. In order to do so, he verbally recounted every one of the murders in intricate detail. He carefully crafted the monologue, taking Garavito back to relive each fantasy of each attack. But the fantasies were not as Garavito remembered them. Duran used explicit detail to build such a vivid mental image of the whole horrors that Garavito inflicted, that after 18 hours, Luis Alfredo Garavito, the world's deadliest serial killer, cried out for Detective Duran to stop. Duran held the murderer in his arms as Garavito, now sobbing, confessed to his crimes by pointing to pictures and explaining in detail what he had done to each of the children and how he had done it. Garavito defended himself by claiming that he had been possessed by evil spirits before each of the kills, theories he attempted to support by the referencing of his journals. Each of his journals was color-coded blue or red. The blue ones, which he claimed were his own, consisted of Bible verses and other pure thoughts. The red ones contained detailed descriptions of his kills. In December, Garavito was finally tried and convicted on two murder counts. The first was for a murder in Tunja, the central province of where 14-year-old Silvino Rodriguez's dismembered and tortured body had been discovered in June 1996. The second count was for the attempted rape of Ivan Sabogal, the 12-year-old boy from western Villa Vicencio, on whose account he was finally apprehended in April of 1999. Beginning a series of torture rapes on minors aged 6 to 16 in the autumn of 1980, Garavito was estimated to have raped and tortured a minimum of 200 minors minors before committing the rape, torture, mutilation, and murder of an additional 189 minors in Colombia from October 4th, 1992 to April 21st, 1999, and a further four murders in Ecuador during the summer of 1998. Garavito had, in fact, confessed to the murders of over 190 young boys, although experts believe the actual total to be closer to 300. A lack of conclusive evidence, however, prevented Garavito's conviction on other counts. The death penalty does not exist in the Colombian legal system, and they had long ago declared that the longest a man could be imprisoned was 60 years. However, things changed soon after, in 2000, when the Colombian Penal Code underwent modification, now stating that no individual can be imprisoned for more than 40 years. Garavito confessed to murdering about 140 children and was charged with killing 172 altogether throughout Colombia. He was found guilty on 138 of the 172 accounts. The others are ongoing. Garavito was sentenced to 1,853 years and nine days in prison, the lengthiest sentence in Colombian history. However, Colombian law limits imprisonment to 40 years and, because Garavito helped police find the victims' bodies, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. Yes, you heard me correctly. Garavito is currently serving his sentence in a maximum security prison in Valle du Par in the department of El Cesar in Colombia. He is held separately from all other prisoners because it is feared that he would be killed immediately. Let those motherfuckers take him. Are you kidding me? Garavito has been described as a model prisoner. Are they... <laughs> aren't they all? There's no children in prison. Of course, he's a model prisoner. He has been studying through his incarceration and has issued a public apology to the people of Colombia. Blah, 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 blah. He will become eligible for parole in 2023. Oh, great. When he has served three fifths of his sentence, that is right now, as we all know. That's fucked up. Garavito remains hopeful, having expressed to Colombian Senator Carlos Moreno de Caro apparent plans to enter Colombian Congress, enter the ministry, 
ministry as a Pentecostal pastor and marry a woman in rejection of his self-admitted homosexuality in the hopes that he and being a fucking pedophile in the hopes that he will be able to help abused children upon his release. Let's get him around some more children. That's what that's what needs to happen. Garavito suffers from severe eye cancer. Good. Which leaves him weak and fatigued, requiring daily blood transfusions. Good. Fuck you. He spends most of his time making handcuffs, earrings, and necklaces in the medical unit of the prison. Many Colombians criticize the possibility of Garavito's early release. In recent years, Colombians have increasingly felt that Garavito's sentence was not sufficient punishment for his crimes. Some have argued he deserves either life in prison or the death penalty, neither of which exist in Colombia. Colombian law had no provision or method to impose a sentence longer than what Garavito received, which was seen as a deficiency in the law caused by the failure to address the possibility of a serial killer in Colombian society. The law has since increased the maximum penalty for such crimes to 60 years in prison. Journalist Guillermo Prito La Rota interviewed Garavito for a show which was broadcast on June 11th of 2006. Harry mentioned that during the interview, Garavito tried to minimize his actions and expressed intent to start a political career in order to help abuse children. Piri also described Garavito's conditions in prison and commented that due to good behavior, he could probably apply for early release within three years. Under extreme public pressure, a judicial review of the case has been launched. Garavito could face additional charges for murders that he has not previously confessed to. Such crimes would not fall under the influence of the previous legal process. The victimology and methodology of a crime are where one will ultimately find the answers to the whys that crop up during the investigation of a serial killer. Both aspects are crucial in building an offender's profile, a fact that held true in the case of Luis Alfredo Garavito. Garavito's victims were always male, always ranging from 6 to 16, and generally slim with brown hair and light eyes. They were either street children who would not be missed or boys who were impoverished enough to be taken in by the promise of a few coins or sweets. They basically paralleled Garavito himself. Psychologists theorized that for Garavito, the young boys who were from impoverished backgrounds were stand-ins for the child Garavito, who had suffered multiple rapes at the hands of his neighbors. Even the age of the victims coincides with the age from which he began to be subjected to abuse, which continued until he finally left home. In Garavito's mind, the children he chose represented his own childhood self, but it wasn't enough for Garavito to merely abduct a child or even rape him. There was an entire method to his madness that in the most warped ways made perfect sense. Garavito himself had been raped by the neighbors and abused by his father, parental figures, or adults that he trusted. It was this bond of trust that Garavito felt compelled to replicate with his victims. Instead of simply abducting the children, Garavito would build an elaborate ruse in which he would pose as a handicapped old man or a monk, a missionary, a humanitarian worker, even a harmless street peddler. In each instance, Garavito used his assumed persona to build trust between himself and the child. It was how he explained away his own mistake, trusting his neighbors. Surely if so many boys did the same, was it really his fault that he had been victimized in the way that he had? But it wasn't just the victim profiles that defined Garavito, it was also his crimes. Rather, his crimes followed a strict systematic procedure, one that was indicative of his sadistic and sociopathic nature. Garavito would first rape and then torture his victims. It's worth noting that the torture was a part of his methodology, an act that points to the reconstruction of his own childhood trauma only amplified. He consistently used screwdrivers or knives to commit these acts. The disturbing fact is, with the Colombian legal system being what it is, it is entirely possible that this mass murderer, who once littered the Colombian landscape with the small bodies of children, might leave his maximum security holding cell in just a few short months from now. I hope you were horrified. I hope you were disgusted. I hope you found this story interesting. I know I did. I can't believe this isn't a bigger case that people do, but I'm glad to bring it to you. I hope we all learned something. But of course, let's end on a different note. So I bring to you animals. They're fucking cool. Magawa the rat 
who was awarded a gold medal for his heroism, is retiring from his job detecting landmines. In a five-year career, the rodent sniffed out 71 landmines and dozens more unexploded items in Cambodia. But his handler, Malen, says the seven-year-old African giant pouched rat is slowing down as he reaches old age, and she wants to respect his needs. Magawa was trained by the Belgium-registered charity Apopo, which is based in Tanzania and has been raising the animals known as hero rats to detect landmines since the 1990s. The animals are certified after a year of training. Last week, Apopo said a new batch of young rats had been assessed by the Cambodian Mine Action Center and passed with flying colors. Magawa, the group said, would stay in post for a few more weeks to mentor the new recruits and help them settle in. Quote, Magawa's performance has been unbeaten and I have been proud to work side by side with him, said Malin. He is small, but he has helped save many lives, allowing us to return much-needed safe land back to our people as quickly and cost-effectively as possible. Last September, Magawa was awarded a PDSA gold medal, sometimes described as the George Cross for Animals, for his life-saving devotion to duty. He was the first rat to be given the medal in the charity's 77-year history. He weighs 2.6 pounds and is 28 inches long. While that is far larger than many other rat species, Magawa is still small enough and light enough that he does not trigger mines if he walks over them. The rats are trained to detect a chemical compound within the explosives, meaning they ignore scrap metal and can search for mines more quickly. Once they find an explosive, they scratch the top to alert their human co-workers. Magawa is capable of searching a field the size of a tennis court in just 20 minutes, something Apopo says would take a person with a metal detector between one and four days. And that is animals... They're fucking cool. Good job, Magawa. He's so cute. Yeah, I think I already said it, but I hope you enjoyed. I know it was horrific. The next one will be too. We're going to do part two of the Colombian serial killers next time. And until then, try to keep your life together. Be nice. I don't know. Eat something fucking good. Do that. Okay, love you. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Full source notes are available at mistressofthemacabrepodcast.com as well as photos pertaining to each episode. Follow along on Instagram for all the insane and gory photos at Mistress of the Macabre Podcast. Please leave a five star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps the show grow and I will love you forever. And tell a friend if you even have any. Bonus content is available at patreon.com or on Apple Podcast subscriptions. I'm just one young teenage girl writing, researching, producing, editing, and recording the show. Your support goes a long way. If you have topic ideas, questions, comments, animal facts, or unsettling stories you'd like to share, email me at mistressofthemacabrepodcast at gmail.com. And if you hate me, just don't email me at all.